Uh, the U.S. is moving through a period right now when our population is becoming older. Every, every individual, of course, is getting older, but the population at large is also aging. And we will, in 20 or 30 years, have a population which is significantly older than the U.S. population today. Older, for example, than the population of Florida is today, when people many often think about that as a, a state with a lot of old people. The U.S. will be older still by the time we get to 2030 or 2040. And uh, that, of course, has some implications for the broader operation of an economy. Uh, when we have more older individuals, uh, that means that the fraction of, the, of, of those individuals in the economy who are in the labor force will probably be lower. It means there are more people who are dependent upon either their own personal saving that they did while working or that are dependent on government programs, uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, to provide them with, uh, with an important part of their support. And uh, the transition that takes place as an economy goes from one that has, as we do now, the baby boomers still mostly in the, in the labor force, to one that has that large part of the population in the retirement years, is one that, uh, that will require some at least careful thought and perhaps adaptation of some of the institutions that we're accustomed to seeing operating in our economy. One of the challenges, frankly, that individuals are confronting as we, as we go through this period of expanding life expectancy is that the number of years that they need to be prepared for when they get to retirement is higher than it was even as recently as 25 or 30 years ago. And uh, you know, if you look at a, a, a couple that's 65 years old today, and you ask how long are they likely to, to need to pay off in, in retirement years, uh, if they're both out of the labor force, uh, many times they'll say, well, we're thinking of 20 years retirement, you know, 85. The chance that, that, that at least one of them will make it to the age of 90 is, is more than 50%. So that's a, you know, that's a 25 year retirement for someone. Uh, it, the chance that, that someone will make it into their mid 90s uh, is also quite substantial. So one of the things that economists and financial planners who work on these issues are, are trying, I think, to communicate is uh, you need to be prepared for a quite long retirement if you want to, to, to really reduce the risk of, of outliving your resources. Uh, and that many people have not quite taken account, I think, of the, of the remarkable changes that have happened in, in terms of life expectancy. As, as with many other parts of the economy where we're hearing a lot about inequality, the, the mortality improvements, the demographic changes, have also been unequal in what's played out. So someone who has worked in a, in a, a, a physically demanding manual career through most of their life and who has not managed to accumulate much in the way of financial resources, uh, those, that person uh, may, may not have, you know, be, fa be facing the very long potential retirement period uh, on average that, that others who may, may be experiencing. And I think it's, it's important to begin to recognize that source of, of variability as we think about the retirement planning process in general. What is very, very central to the, to the retirement uh, income structure in the, in the U.S. today is there are a large number of individuals for whom Social Security is actually their primary source of support in retirement. Uh, at, you know, between a quarter and a half of the individuals who are over 65 today, uh, a very large part of their income is coming just from Social Security. And what that tells you is that uh, as we think about potential reforms to that system going forward, uh, you know, the protecting the, that, that bottom part of the distribution is, is a quite important consideration and needs to be carefully considered in any, in any of the reform discussions. But, uh, you know, what, what Social Security, one of, the, one of the features of Social Security is that it, it replaces a higher share of the income for those whose incomes have been low than for people who's have, whose incomes have been high. So in some cases, for someone who's had a, a, a job which paid them in the bottom quarter of the, of the earnings distribution, for example, uh, their Social Security replacement rate uh, will be well over 50% when they, when they get to retirement. And for someone who's in the top tier of the distribution, their Social Security replacement rate will be much lower. So I, I, I don't think one would want to, you know, encourage people to, to plan to live on just Social Security. But it is true that Social Security provides a, a bigger uh, fraction of the, of the pre-retirement income for those who are low income than for those who are high income. Around the, the median income, median, median wage earner, their Social Security replacement rate would be about 50%. So they, they, you know, they, they're, they're not going to be continuing the wages they had before. Uh, on the other hand, they're not going to fall way, way down, right? So, so the next question becomes, if they had nothing else, is 50% enough? 
my, my own guess is it's probably not. They need, they need more. Uh, for someone who's down further in the distribution, maybe at the 25th percentile of the, of the wage distribution, their replacement rate's higher. It's about 75%. So, so they don't have to fall as far. But even that, that may be a challenge. One of the things, the second, second part of this, though, and you know, one of the things that economics research has been struggling to try to measure is uh, effectively what do you need? in mm -hmm. retirement relative to what you needed before. When you're retired and you have more time, you may actually be able to prepare more meals at home. That cuts your costs. You may be able to take advantage of the sales more effectively. You may choose to you know, eat at the early bird special before four o'clock <laughs> in the afternoon instead of, instead of at the seven o'clock uh, evening sitting when, when everyone is, is busy. So there are a number of ways in which the, 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 the prices that people face for the goods that they are consuming may be somewhat different. You may have more flexibility in when you take a vacation that's not driven by your work schedule that may enable you to, to, you know, to travel at times when it's less expensive. So there, there's a lot of research being done on exactly this question now, trying to figure out how do we you know, answer the question, what does it take to live the same way in retirement that you did before? We haven't quite got to the answer, but we, we have the, the, the pieces that you can see from some of this. There are broadly speaking two kinds of pension plans. One is called a defined benefit plan and the other is called defined contribution. And, and they more or less are what they sound. A defined benefit plan is one where the employer is pinning down what the benefit that the pension beneficiary will receive in retirement will be. So uh, think, and, and, these, and these were once very common in, in corporate America. They are much less common today, although they still are quite common in, pu in the public sector, both state and local governments, and, and in some cases uh, in, in the federal government. Uh, the, the, the defined benefit plan says, uh, you know, if you work for a certain number of years, you will qualify for a benefit, and that benefit might be a a fraction of your final salary at the at the place you were working. So a standard rule might be one and a half percent of your salary times the number of years that you worked. So if you have a career of 40 years at a, at a particular employer, you'll retire with a benefit of 60 percent of your final salary and that benefit will be paid every year until you die or depending on the choices you make might be paid until you die or and, and carry on for your spouse. Uh, the, the key to that, the, the key feature of that plan is that the employer is committing to deliver a particular set of benefits to you once you retire. Uh, conditional on making it to retirement under that plan, uh, there's not a lot of risk that the beneficiary faces, except insofar as you know, the benefits are usually defined in, in nominal terms. Uh, if inflation were to pick up, that can erode the value of those kind of plans. And if, if it was a private sector employer, there's a chance that if the, at least in the 1960s and early 70s, if the employer had not put away resources and funded those pension benefits, the, the employer might go bankrupt and the, the workers, uh, the now retirees, might, might not receive very much. And since 1974, we had a, a, a water, watershed piece of legislation called the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, ERISA. Mm -hmm. And ERISA basically guaranteed, set, set up a set of, of federal guarantees around pensions and set up an insurance program to tie, try to avoid the situation where workers might be left high and dry if the, if the firm went away. Uh, that's the defined benefit part. Firms, the private sector firms have, have largely moved away from defined benefit plans over the course of the last 25 years toward what are called defined contribution plans. And these are things like 401k plans that many people will be familiar with. Defined contribution plans are plans where the employer and the employee define the, the contribution that's being made to the plan and then the employee has essentially an account in which the contributions this year's and previous years are all combined and that account you hope grows in value uh, and then when you get to retirement uh, you've built up a, a substantial account balance and that can be used to support retirement living now the, the you can see when you begin to think about this where the the risk differences are uh, between the defined benefit and the defined contribution the defined contribution plan, uh, the money that you've put into the account, you need to make an investment decision about how you're going to invest that. Uh, you, might hold, uh, you might hold just bonds, uh, very safe bonds like U.S. Treasury bonds. Those bonds offer a very low rate of return today. So someone who invested this whole defined contribution account only in Treasury bonds would, would see it growing very slowly over the years at this point. You might invest in something which arguably will promise a higher average return. Common stocks would be a natural example. 
Uh, but they they're, they're, they're variable in value. And anybody who lived through the financial crisis of 2008-09 uh, and watched their 401k balance uh, gyrate during that period knows exactly how, uh, how risky uh, that kind of an investment strategy can be. Of course, people have a very long horizon in many cases, so maybe they can handle the risk over a, a longer period of time. The critical thing that the defined contribution plan is doing is it's saying the employer is committing to either putting money into the plan or matching the contribution that you make up front. But at that point, the employer's liability stops and it's on the employee to manage this account going forward. So one of the critical things that's happened as we moved from defined benefit to defined contribution is that the, the employee, the individual, is now charged with making more decisions that are ultimately consequential for their retirement support. They're having to decide how much to contribute to the 401k plan. They have to decide how to invest the money once they contribute it. They have to decide once they get to retirement when they're going to draw that money out and how they're going to draw it out. Do they want to buy an annuity, which pays them a certain amount for as long as they live? Or do they want to just let the, the corpus, the balance, sit there and then when they need it, begin to draw money out? Only about half of those people who, of individuals who reach age 65 have, have any wealth built up in, in a defined contribution account. And, and when I say defined contribution, I mean a, a 401k plan, a 403b plan, an individual retirement account, any of those, uh, of those possibilities. I'm, I'm putting them all together. Uh, so, so, the, so the top half of the distribution has something. Uh, many of those who have something have very little. So, you know, part of that is because the defined contribution system has only been up and running for about 20 years, 25 years, and that means that some people have not contributed for their whole career. But a lot of the folks have had opportunities to contribute to these plans, and they just haven't contributed all that much over the course of their, of their working career. So one of, the, one of the challenges in the defined contribution structure is making sure that people are aware that they need to contribute a significant amount during their working years in order to build up the balance that will enable them to support their, their retirement consumption. Uh, and we, we are, we're going through, frankly, a transitional phase for, for the 401k or the defined contribution uh, structure, where 25 years ago, hardly anybody reached retirement with much wealth in a, in a 401k. Today, as I said, about half the folks getting to retirement do have something in a 401k or an IRA, but many of them have small balances. What, what, one key issue is what's it going to look like in another 10 or 15 years when very few people will get to retirement with a private corporate defined benefit plan. The, the, the defined contribution plans will be much more important at that stage and uh, will, in fact, the balances have, have tracked up in a way that is commensurate with the increasing burden that those plans are going to have to cover in providing retirement support. You know, it's a, it's a vexing problem, and I don't think we have great answers to it. Uh, you know, part, part of, it can be decomposed into, into several different components, I think. One is just making sure that, uh, that workers have access to a defined contribution plan, particularly at smaller firms, smaller employers. There's still a lot of places where people don't have access to a 401k. And uh, the, the challenge is for those who aren't in that group, uh, getting access for them. And we, we might want to consider at some point you know, incentives for the firms to make those plans available. Okay? But then if we, if we look even within those who, who do have access, some folks choose not to contribute at all. Uh, for somebody who's working at a firm where their employer is matching their contribution into the plan, that's a really good deal typically. And uh, I, I think, you know, I certainly tell my friends, my students, uh, it's, a, it's a good idea to take advantage of those, of those extra dollars the employer is, taking it, it is willing to offer by, by doing the, the matching and to try to contribute to these plans. Uh, the, the other problem, frankly, is that some people withdraw the money before they get to retirement. You know, people who, anyone who's, who's moved jobs knows that sometimes you have access, you can take a, a, a withdrawal from your 401k and just cash it out. Even if you're only 30 years old and the balance is you know, $4,000, uh, that balance can, can, can actually accumulate to something pretty substantial yeah. if you keep it invested all the way until retirement. And pulling the money out weakens the, the amount that's going to be built up uh, as, you, as you move toward retirement. And, and that's, I think, a, a challenge in this. And then finally, there are folks who, when they get to retirement, uh, th there's, there's some people, but I don't think very many, who draw the balance down very quickly. And that, you know, that, that runs into the risk that you're not going to be able to, to make it all the way to the, the, late, the late years of retirement with the resources available.
available to support you at that stage. So all of these things contribute. I, I think the, 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 the best thing to do uh, at this point is to work hard on a what I call financial education campaign to try to, to, try to help people recognize the, the issues they need to think about here. Uh, you know, we, in, in energy, if, if you're buying an appliance, right, and uh, we're trying to get people to understand energy efficiency kinds of things, uh, we don't require them to take the, the course in, in, in applied physics to understand why their refrigerator is going to be using more or less electricity, but we do have very simple ways of characterizing this is a relatively efficient refrigerator or this is a not efficient one. We were able to give them simple numbers on monthly electricity costs and things like that. Uh, finding ways to communicate the, 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 the rudiments of retirement saving and the relationship between saving the horizon over which you save and the benefits you're going to have in retirement uh, in ways that are similarly transparent would be very helpful.